Welcome. We see some folks joining us. I'm going to kick off here in just a minute, the top of the hour. <clears throat> All right, hello. Welcome everyone. It is the top of the hour, so I think we'll kick off. So hello, welcome to the Interaction Associates Collaborative Intelligence Webinar Series. This is our fourth and final installment of the series. And this is our live panel question and answer session that we like to call Ask Me Anything. So this series has generated a ton of great questions from our participant community. We've gathered those up along the way to address them today, and we'll also answer your questions in real time. So we're fortunate to be joined by several distinguished panelists today. I can't wait to hear all of the wonderful insights that you will all bring. First up, I'd like to introduce Davida Sharp, a senior consultant with Interaction Associates. She comes to us with 30 years of experience in leadership development and consulting. Welcome, Davida. Thank you. Next, we have Susan DeGenring, also a senior consultant here at IA, the former director of product development. She's built a lot of amazing programs, and she's also the founder of Still Mind Coaching Solutions. Great to see you, Susan. Thanks, Rachel. And last but certainly not least, we have our CEO of Interaction Associates, Barry Rosen. Welcome, Barry. Thank you very much, Rachel. Good to be here. Great to have you. And my name is Rachel Grail. I'll be your moderator today. Also in the background, we've got our virtual producer, Lindsay Watkins. So please feel free to send her a message if you need any technical support throughout the session. But I'll let you know how to kick it off. I see many of you are already engaged in chat. So that's excellent. Go ahead and open that up if you haven't already. But before we dive into all that, I wanna do a kind of a high level review of what we covered throughout the series in the last couple of months. How did we get here? So also wanna let you know that we'll be sending the recordings out of all four of these sessions as well if you missed any of these. So as you may know, Interaction Associates has been really a pioneer in the space of collaboration for over 50 years. And now we're bringing all of that experience to a new program called Better Together Collaborative Intelligence at Work. So this is where Barry and I started the series by giving you an overview of the essential qualities of an effective collaboration and what skills you can develop to increase your collaborative capability. Then our next session dove deeper into one of the most critical and foundational competencies for collaboration, expanding awareness. In that session, Susan and Larry Rosenberg highlighted some of the common challenges to awareness and how we can begin to overcome them. Following that, Davida and Eve Keller hosted an incredibly rich conversation on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how we can move to a future that's more authentic and, and really more effective in this realm. And that brings us here today. So how you can participate, we really wanna hear your insights, your questions, your reactions to what you hear. You can do all of that in the chat. Do remember to click everyone instead of hosts and panelists, unless of course you wanna send the hosts and panelists a private chat, which you are welcome to do so. You can ask questions in the chat or you can ask questions in the Q&A section, which is located along with the rest of your Zoom functions. Usually that's at the bottom of the screen, but depending on your settings, you may find it at the top. Also, if you wanna adjust the size of your screen so that you see the slides smaller and all of our wonderful panelists larger, there is a slide bar that you can access in between the slides and the images of the video. Again, if you have any problems or need support, just drop Lindsay a note and she can help you find your way. All right, I love seeing where everyone is coming from. Thank you for doing that. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. We are scattered all around. And uh, let's dive into our first question. So here we are. What are the key differences between collaboration and consensus? I think this is a great place to start. Let's hand this over to you, Barry. Thank you. Thank Hi, everybody. Well, 
getting our definitions down about all words related to collaboration is a good idea. Now, I think about uh, collaboration as just people working together to achieve some common goal, collaborate, working together to achieve a common goal. And in the house that collaboration is, consensus is one of several decision-making methods. So collaboration is, oh, we're working together. Consensus is one of the decision-making methods. A decision-making method, one of the rooms in the house that collaboration is, is decide and announce with your rationale. You're a leader. You make a decision and then you let people know about what your decision is. That is could be, in a certain circumstances, an important decision-making method. And you can gather information as a leader and then make a decision. You get people together in a group, hear what they have to say, and then make a decision. Then consensus. Consensus is up the level of uh, uh, getting involvement. And with the idea is that if you get more involvement, there may be greater, uh, greater agreement, greater alignment uh, in order to implement. So consensus it has a very specific definition, at least the one that we use at Interaction Associates. All key stakeholders participate in the decision-making process. So you got to get your key stakeholders in, not all stakeholders, but your key stakeholders. All key stakeholders understand the decision, not necessarily agree with it. Consensus is not agreement. The stakeholders understand the decision and they're willing to support implementation. And the highest level, the, another room in the uh, the house of collaboration is delegation as a decision. So collaboration is the house. It's working together with others to achieve a goal. And then consensus is just one of the decision-making methods. I love that distinction and that image. It, it feels like it's kind of a, a pillar in the house that helps hold up the foundation. Thank you, Barry. Let's go to our next question. So this one's gonna to go to you, Susan. We collaborate with two other organizations on an ongoing basis, but as staff members change, it feels like <clears throat> starting over again and again. What are some ideas of ways to embed collaboration into the DNA? Okay, well, <clears throat> first of all, I wanna say I love this idea of the house of collaboration. I see a mini series in our future. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I wish there was a silver bullet that says you don't have to go back to the basics every time new people belong. But we know from many of the team um, models that are based on research that are out there, whether it's the Tuckman model of forming, storming, norming, or performing, or it's um, the human element will Schutz model where you know groups go through phases of inclusion, control, and openness. It happens to be that you know when anything new comes into a group working together and trying to collaborate, you ha it's like the washing machine effect. You get kind of all you know um, sort of mixed together again and shaken up a little. So. I think that there's some just really important basic human needs you can remember that that can help you maybe do that cycle faster, which is all people want to feel significant, competent, and likable as they join in an organ a new group or a new team or a new collaboration. And different people have different orientations or preferences around those things. But it is important to know that there are needs for inclusion. And especially when you're starting again and again. But it doesn't have to be like a large or a big deal. You know, it only simply means you have to think about what is important as people join. Who are they? How do they orient to the role of the team? And what do they care about? So that you can include them 
and they don't have to fear that they're going to be marginalized because they're not in the, the uh, previous group. And bearing in mind that we as human beings, we do create these kind of energetic, um, I'm going to use this word, clicks. Uh, you know, when we've been together a lot, we have a natural affinity to orient to each other. And if you're, if you want people to start contributing and feeling competent, you have to in, ensure that they feel valued and significant. So I would say, I would say that's my silver bullet. If there is one, that's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that's beautifully articulated and, and speaks a bit to this question that we got in the chat. Thank you for those of you who are inputting questions already. We love that. So we got this question. What are the prerequisites for collaboration? What needs to happen before a group is able to collaborate? And I feel that you spoke to that quite a lot. Does anyone want to add to that? Or Susan, would you like to add anything more about the prerequisites for collaboration to follow on? Well, I'll just say that um, we talk about collaboration in terms of the concept of collaborative intelligence. You know, our, our sort of mission right now with this program that we're going to be launching is about how to you know, elevate the level of collaborative intelligence in a group or a team or an organization. And it's, again, it's, it's not, you know, magic, but it is about finding a way to get from you and me to we, being able to develop the skills that are required to get from you and me to we. That's what, that's what we're trying to do. So, I think that's a start anyway for that question. I love that. Thank you so much. All right, let's go to our next question here. This one will go to you, Davida. How do you effectively collaborate with a senior management team member who often is contradictory and presents themselves as annoyed with the other team members in general? Hello, everybody. I'm looking forward to this question because I've not only experienced in the real world, I've had to coach some people on this uh, behavior. One of the things you're going to hear from me today is to make sure to not make assumptions about why people do what they do. It's important when you're trying to develop your collaborative intelligence to be in curious, interested, and empathetic towards other people. At least that's my belief is a good way of becoming a good collaborator. Um, the person said senior management team, if you're on a senior, it's no different than if you're on any team and someone predicts, you know, presents themselves as contradictory. On the one hand, you can take that person to the side and provide one-on-one -on -one feedback. I would never suggest uh, calling people out in a meeting unless the meeting has completely gone off the rails. But even then, I would say you do these things respectfully and courteously, but I would certainly call a break in the meeting if that is happening live just in time and talk to the person one-on-one -on -one about what's going on. How can you help them be more participative? Sometimes people actually do not know. Don't assume people know. Some people know. We know that. Some people don't know how they're coming across. And the only way they're going to know is if they receive a mirror that they can look in that behavior and that mirror comes in the form of feedback. So you have to provide people with a visual behavioral description of what you're seeing and experiencing in their behavior. And then you can talk to them about the impact on yourself and others. Now, of course, if this gets worse and worse and worse, that calls for something else altogether. But, you know, all of these things that we're talking today about how to work better together, you really have to become better at trying to get to know your colleagues, get to understand them, build those relationships with them. And then if you have deeper collaborative intelligence, where you understand how people collaborate, what's affecting them, what's triggering them, then it'll be easier to give a leader or an individual or anybody better feedback to help them to perform better. But again, my answer would be feedback. 
My answer would be you have to describe for people the behavior you see in them and the impact that it's having on a team. And if I can add one more thing that I, I think is important, I think you know, collaborative intelligence and certainly the work we've been doing at Interactive Associates requires good facilitation skills. You know, if you have good facilitation skills where you know how to help a team and work the team and don't just rely on somebody else to facilitate the team, but us as team participants, we should understand good process facilitation. And so if we all understand good process facilitation, then we can do these interventions in a respectful and appropriate way. You don't want to give back to people that negative energy that they may be putting back on the team. You want to always work at a higher level if you want to demonstrate collaborative intelligence. That would be my response to that question. I love that. Yeah, there are tools that we can apply that can help support people in their own development. That's right. Excellent point. And that kind of connects to this next question here. Someone asked, in my organization, we have a tough time with departments being siloed. How can we collaborate and bridge those gaps when we don't typically interact or know what they are doing? Barry, would you be willing to take this one? I think it's a good follow. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, standing on uh, Davida's shoulders here uh, is like people, departments have needs for control. And they believe that if they have that control, they'll be able to be more productive or effective. So the, they become siloed. Um, but the uh, the reality is, is that when you don't hear what's going on in other places of the organization, particularly if you're part of a value-added chain uh, along different groups to get ultimately to the customer. So if you don't have information from other people on that chain, uh, chances are that you won't come up with a, the best decision or the best outcome from the customer's point of view. So it's good to have cross-functional collaboration. So how do you facilitate cross-functional collaboration? Well, one of ultimately, of course, is leaders that have to demonstrate it. But simple things to do is start up uh, little uh, chat rooms or team rooms. Get your uh, leaders, uh, one of your leaders' um, approval of that. It can come from, say, your department's manufacturing. Everybody can participate. This is something that we're learning in our department. It's like an it's an internal um, education chat function, um, and uh, sponsoring a meeting, saying this is just an open meeting that we're having, just to talk about things that we're learning. In other words, not focused on a particular problem uh, that might um, uh, one of the leaders of the departments might get feel defensive or turf or threatened is just an open-ended forum for us to take a look at issues uh, that face all of us across the organization. These can be a lot of fun too with uh, fun icebreakers. So those are a few things just to get people talking. Great. Thank you so much, Barry. Susan DeVita, do you want to add anything to this one? Well, um, you know, cross-fertilization is so important to innovation today. You don't know all you need to know in your group to get the work done. And I think um, there are two things I've noticed organizations do. Some actually formalize that cross-functional teamwork uh, towards some projects and get people to actually you know, working uh, together and getting to know one another. Susan talked about area uh, earlier, that whole forming, storming, you know, norming uh, process from Tuckman. And, and, you know, that would start then there. So I think one is a formal cross-functional group. Then the other one is our informal uh, groups where people get together to get to know one another. Um, I think that's really important. If groups feel siloed, they're ex you know they experience that and they feel the need to you know get to know people in other groups. We shouldn't just rely on formal structures. We can informally, as individuals, reach out to people in other areas, get to know them and and what they're doing and what they're working on and how the things they do um, impact or relate to the kinds of things I'm responsible for. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you, Davida. 
Well, we had a great live question come in that I, I think I want to throw to Susan, if that's all right with you, Susan. It says, from Lizzie, I've been reflecting on the second session, knowing that strong self-awareness and self-regulation is a vital prerequisite to successful collaboration. How do we as an employer influence slash ensure employees' development of the same? Related, how can we deal with a high-level leader who refuses to develop that self-awareness? Okay, well, let me let me start with the last part of that first. And um, the research on self-awareness, the, there's been a lot of research over the last few years. It's starting to really percolate up now into the mainstream. And one of the interesting pieces of research says that the higher up you are in the power chain, the less self-aware you become. And that's you know, what Davida was speaking to as well, it's partly because you become more isolated, but it's also partly because we start depending on our years of experience and competence and it kind of shields us a little bit and makes us think that we know ourselves. So um, I was reflecting on that question and I thought, well, I hate to put it this way, but I say sometimes you have to, um, create a burning platform for that leader. And you have to show them how their behavior doesn't match their own awareness. So going back up to the rest of the question, and I'm, I'm so glad you're reflecting on it, there are there's some things you can do just in terms of helping people through allowing them to participate in you know self-awareness, training and education, giving them some tools on how to reflect and how to see and unpack their own behaviors and what the consequences of those behaviors are, you know, if they're, if they're um, reacting to things as opposed to really reflecting before responding, for example. So I think that's really important equally as important is to create environments in which uh, there's what we call psychological safety. I and mean, there's been a lot written about that, that people don't have to fear being vulnerable, making mistakes and taking risks. And although that's, that isn't the purview of the individual team members or collaboration members. It is the purview of anybody who has the responsibility for creating the environment in a group. Mm -hmm. Well said. And, and I love that phrase, reflect before respond. Um, yeah, who else would like to contribute? Davida, you have some- uh, Yeah, I, I would, um, because I think this is uh, so important what Susan just said. And, and the only thing I would add to that, Susan, about the psychological safety piece, which I think is so critical today, it's important for organizations not to give any individual permission to behave in those ways just because of the title or the role of leadership. That is part of the of not only norms and organizational culture, but it's just good business. It is good business to not support any senior leader spilling out in that way throughout the organization and people feel as if they have to take it and there's nothing they can do about it. That is the quickest way to lower engagement scores, to diminish um, people's enthusiasm and, 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 and love for the work that they do is to feel as if there is permission granted for people to behave in what we would call inappropriate ways because nothing ever happens. That, that would be the piece I would, cav the caveat I would add to what Susan said, because I think psychological safety is important. Mm, agreed. And Barry, what would you like to add? Uh, well, I'm just, uh, and because I, I agree with what Davida said, of course, we all work together at IA, so we practice certain kinds of things. And one is trying to create psychological safe places for people to share what's on their mind. And as everyone who's listening knows, we get scared. You know, we get threatened. It just happens. Now, 
say you're in an organization, I'm, I'm going to just, uh, you know, throw something in the room. A lot has been written lately about Elon Musk. Okay. He has many organizations. He scares the hell out of people. And he basically says, hey, listen, you want to work in this company, then be prepared to sleep here, you know, like I do. It's a certain kind of leadership. Now you'd say, well, hey, look at all the innovation that's going on there. To answer the question by saying, well, let's wait and see what happens to Twitter slash X, or, or let's uh, wait and see what happens to SpaceX. No, here's the thing. Even Elon Musk is capable of self-reflection. And it's his. we know his shadow and a lot of leaders' shadows undermine, sometimes undermine performance. Sometimes the stress that they put people under is actually creates momentum, creates a burning platform for people. So what's the bridge? The bridge is insight, is basically saying, what have we learned? What have you learned? And to say, if we're not, if we want to innovate, we want to create also a learning organization in which people are encouraged to share their insights and their learning. As, uh, so I'll just leave it at that. And I think in another question, we'll get to how being able to kind of reflect back to someone, not what you're just what you're seeing or your opinions, but what their underlying interests are, their underlying concerns, because that's what people re really wanna know. Elon want, Musk wants to break through wants to make money, but breakthrough, wants to go to Mars. So there are things that this, you know, leaders want, and we have to be aware of what they are. Right. People are, are being driven by something underneath. Yeah. Excellent point. Lizzie, thank you so much for that question. Please do keep the questions coming in. We love them. Let's go to another one that came before the session. Now, what's the best way to collaborate when individuals have their own priorities or agendas? Susan, would you be willing to take this one? Sure. Okay. Well, first of all, everybody has their own priorities or agendas because we all have our own interests. And, you know, some people have a tend more of a tendency to be more ex expressive about their priorities. And some of us tend to hold them back a little bit, but we all have them. So, this is about attitude and skill. So the attitude part is first that we, we talk about um, there are certain qualities that make for collaboratively intelligent people and entities. And one of those, two of the, three of those, there's four. Okay, first mm -hmm. is purposeful. Uh, next is being considerate. The third is trustworthy, and the fourth is adaptive. So speaking to considerate, what's really important is that there is an attitude of wanting to collaborate to begin with. And um, there's ways that you can see if that's true or not true. If you can establish an attitude by creating the kind of environment that that makes it safe for people to collaborate versus an environment that is, even if they say it's collaborative, really isn't because the incentive systems or other institutional structures make it actually competitive, not collaborative. Um, that's not going to work. But once you have a situation in which that is true, or even if you have a poor environment for collaboration, individuals can still become very skilled at understanding and making space for people to express their underlying concerns, their underlying wants. We don't usually, we don't always speak you know, come right out and say what it is that we're worried about or that we want because we might hide things because we don't think it's appropriate or it's not um, it's not aligned with the goal or the mission of the team, et cetera. And 
good facilitators and people who have become more collaboratively intelligent know how to read between the lines or go under the surface and say, all right, tell me what is your concern behind that statement? Or I sometimes like to say, what's the question behind your question? And we, we call that, um, you know, interests, we're looking for interests, underlying interests. And when you bring those out, it becomes a more safe environment to collaborate, even if the underlying interests are not aligned with each other. Then you have the skill of being able to align based on interest. And you can do that. There's ways to do that. So I would say that's, you know, that's my answer in terms of, you know, collaboration isn't for the faint of heart, really. <laughs> it really takes a lot to be good at collaborating. So anybody else have a build on that they want to make? Davida Berry? I just throwed in the chat that collaboration. <laughs> that, yes. that was perfect. Collaboration isn't for the faint of heart. Mm -hmm. And I just said, remember that. I didn't mean to put a question mark. I meant to put an exclamation. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, I also really like, say. Thank you. I also really like what Chris added to the chat. I like the idea of using clear language, asking the leader, what concerns do you have? What are your biggest priorities that I can help with? Helps to frame the question and ask in a clear way. It also helps to model to others ways to interact in a positive manner. Excellent ad, Chris. Thank you so much for putting that in. All right, let's go to our next question here. We've got a few more really great ones here. How do we ensure all collaborators find value in the relationship? Now we have this one going to you as well, Susan. Well, I, I'll, I'll start it off and then I'll invite I'll invite my colleagues. Um, you know, I, for me, I'm kind of a relationship-based person. So I, I feel like collaboration is all about relationship. It's not, it's also about process and tasks, et cetera. But I think that it's a little bit of what I've already said about um, people finding value in the collaboration. And I'll go back to the purposeful part of our little packed model of what are the high, high, um, the best, highest characteristics of a collaborative um, individual or group, and say that people people like to have a purpose, and sometimes it's not a common purpose, but they like to have something, whether they know it or not. They're driven by a purpose and they're driven by a want of some type. So they're gonna find value in the relationship when, when their underlying wants are being met. But also I can't, I guess I can't emphasize enough that if you understand what people want, it could be that they want to learn and grow in this endeavor that they're in or it could be that they have you know a high interest in achievement and they want to be recognized for their work or it could be that they're just really very very interested in the in the task the science or the the mechanism mechanisms behind the work you have to know what they want and once you you know what they want you can sort of tailor it so that they feel that they're that they are valued. I think there's there's more. I mean, if you look at you know Amy Edmondson's psychological safety definition, people feel confident to take risks without fear of being negatively impacted when speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. That that also lays you know a powerful foundation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else want to jump in there? I, I well, think I, I'll just, just, you know, 
uh, you're talking about the feeling mode, you know, that people we like, uh, you know, we like people or we don't like them, you know, you automatically cut people a break who you kind of, oh, I like this person. Maybe it's because of similarities that you have. Or for me, when someone says they like the San Francisco Giants and they commiserate with me about the season, you know, I kind of <laughs> have a I have a, an affinity with them, you know, uh, and there are other people who are, are different or they have different styles or whatever than I, you know, so, so the first thing is the getting beyond the automatic uh, attraction aversion and, and that, you know, that that person that you're working with is important for your success. That's the time I think Davida and Susan have both said is really to slow down and go, what does this person want? And even ask them. Because if you ask a person what they want or what they feel about a situation and really listen, it makes a big difference, even if they think you're an enemy. And I've learned, I've, yeah, I've learned that by working with competing groups or people who are actually in violent situations and that listening to the other and really listening uh, makes a big difference. I think this connects to what Jack shared in the chat, saying collaboration by some definition requires that others accept the one non-collaborative person. Mm. In fact, listen harder to that person. Mm -hmm. Forcing or even facilitating a must collaborate seems to fly in the face of the concept. It really is in this way, the people who challenge us are our trainers. They are our mm -hmm. developers of our collaborative intelligence. Beautiful. And uh, that actually connects perfectly to this, this next question that we have that sounds like an, an acute challenge. What do you do when you've given constructive feedback, but the other party essentially shuts down when you need to collaborate again in the future? Uh -huh. you do when you're speaking to them, will ignore emails, won't do what you've asked them to do, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Oof. Davida, would you it. take this one? Yeah, I'll take it. Um, the first, <laughs> well, you know, this is reality. These things happen because um, the brain is an interesting thing. The brain gravitates towards those negative things. Part of it's uh, our defense mechanism to protect us from harmful situations. But if you just ask somebody to think about powerful experiences they've had, many times they're about negative things that happen. So that's the first thing we need to understand that it's, you know, if it's something negative, it's very easy to glom onto it. I think the second thing though, it's I, if I would uh, speak to the person, people who would ask this question, remain calm and don't make assumptions. It may not be about you. I appreciate what how the question is written. I really do. But don't always assume that you, because you see a behavior that it's about you. It could be about something else. So that's when more feedback is required. If you see this as a pattern of behavior, that's when you want to check in with the individual, not in an accusatory way, but in a factual way and provide them with that observation. This is what I experienced. This is what I observe. Um, how do you want me to respond to that? What does that mean? You know, because I think you can make things worse when you come at people with an assumption. In fact, I would say that um, being a person who questions assumptions and, you know, check yourself on the assumptions that you're making is a good way to build collaborative intelligence because collaborative intelligence is about getting things on the table so that you can talk about them and gain different people's perspective about them and if appropriate, make a decision. So I think it's really important to take time out to think about the behavior you're seeing and just go to the individual and provide them with more feedback, but don't, don't, don't do as they do. Uh, don't um, be accusatory. Don't accuse them of anything. Because in some ways, when you say, you're shutting down, I need to collaborate with you, you won't look at me. You're asking that question as if in, in an, an accusatory way. So it's really important to check the facts for yourself. I always think that describing behavior in a descriptive, factual way 
and talking about the impact that has on you is the safest way to continue to create psychological safety, even if it's your inclination to respond in kind to someone who's not being pleasant or professional <laughs> or collaborative. Um, Barry or Susan, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I okay. would just I would just add um, Davida and and to whomever wrote this question, we're learning a lot, as Davida said, about how the brain works. We live in this wonderful time where we have all these uh, technological advances that enable us to understand the brain. And one of the things that brains who are oriented to negativity, which is all of our brains, it's just a biological um, inheritance, we haven't evolved yet past the savanna so well, um, is that we also like to focus toward the future. So while, and it's important to understand the impact of my behavior. And then once you get that, it's like, what can I do about it in the future? So give me, give me something that's going to help me move forward in that feedback process. And I think that that, that makes, that calms the, the brain down a little bit because it's like, oh, well, I don't have to live in this mistake I made in the past. Or even if, if there's uh, and a um, and a aversion type relationship going on, you know the you can give people an inkling of what will make it more successful for them in the future. I love that. It would be even better if you could. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. how can we do this better in the future? I love that future focus. Very and how, can I just say what you said, Rachel, I'm sorry to cut you off. The other thing you, you just said, how can we, how can we make it better? It's not just you. Okay, you did something that was hurtful or not useful for me, but how can we make it better in the future? What could I do as well as what can you do? And Susan, I would just add, if it was truly constructive feedback, it would have included a future oriented yes. conversation. Yeah. Great, yeah. Barry, anything to add? Oh, well, a million things, but uh, no, not now. <laughs> I think we have another question about feedback coming down the line. So I'll, I'll say my, my piece then. We do, we do. Yeah. Well, this next one I think uh, could be really relatable for many folks here. What tips or best practices <clears throat> share on collaborative challenges with a newly formed remote team? I want to take that on, Rachel, Davida, because yeah. um, for, uh, I would say, since 2001, I have worked virtually. Um, I've worked for another organization for uh, 26 years, and I managed... Uh, virtually. And so I had to do a lot of this work. This was before the pandemic, when it was not as common. So one of the, the things I learned in managing a variety of teams is that it's really important to get to know for, for not just the leader, but everyone on the team to get to know one another and have conversations that are relationship oriented and not just task oriented. So Susan earlier talked about you know, those three cores of task relationship and process. So you can have the best process in the world. And you can be clear about the tasks that you need to have done or that you're, you're, brick, you're coming together for. But as a remote team, it's really important to um, give the team time to get to know one another and to do those getting to know one another activities, why they're there, <laughs> you know, what's needed from them, um, what kinds of check-ins are going to be involved and that kind of thing. Um, so that's one thing. And then the second thing I would say is that people should be on camera a lot of the time if it's virtual. I know that there are organizations that give people permission not to be on camera. And I understand why all of that's done, but I think it's really important for people mm -hmm 
to be able to see one another's faces on occasion in the absence of that face-to-face -face experience. So that those are some tips that I learned over my uh, 20 years. It, you know, it's important to be face-to-face, -face, make time for one another to talk about those relationship-oriented things and not just focus on tasks and relationships. Anyone else want to jump in on that? I want to kind of fold in as we as we round out this question, some comments from Jamie, which I think are important, is this this common challenge to uh, building up the relationship in that way. People say we have this compressed time. Um, we've got all this expected performance. I think it's really easy to say we don't have time for all of that. And then Nan said you can pay now or you can pay later. So maybe it's a, a go slow to go fast situation, but I think that is a common um, argument that you hear. Like, I don't have time to build a relationship on the remote team. Any Anyone want to comment on that as we move forward with this question? Yeah, I, I'll just take a shot at that. Um, we've been, you know, like DeVita, we have, we meaning some of us <clears throat> at Interaction Associates and Barry and I in particular have been building learning around how to work virtually since 2012 and even earlier. And I remember the, in the early days before Zoom even existed, you know, we had other platforms like WebEx and GoToMeeting. And there, at that time, there had been research quite a bit of research about, well, what makes for a successful virtual team? And one of the, the things that is the easiest thing you can do that they discovered made the difference between a virtual team that achieved their outcomes and one that didn't was use your webcam. So, you know, it's a simple thing. And, and I think what I notice now is that a lot of um, organizations, you know, ask people to use the, their webcam at particular times in the meeting so they don't have to feel overexposed all the time. But I like to say, hey, if you were still working in a face to face environment, you could not turn off your face. You know, <laughs> you would still have to work and look at each other. So um, I, I just, I think it's a, it's it's vital to have the webcam on for certain types of conversations. Yeah, we have a question in the chat about, um, but you don't necessarily want to invite people into your homes, and that's why these beautiful backgrounds are available. I'm using one right now, and uh, I think that's it's just the easiest thing. If you don't want people in your homes, use a background screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was. Uh, I know that it sounds like tough love. Uh, in some organizations where we worked and and uh, taught our meetings uh, meeting facilitation skills, uh, they said, "Well, if you um, if you don't have a desired out set of desired outcome statements before you go in a meeting, then it's okay for people to leave." And it was like, "Hey, listen, this is an expectation that we have that when you run your meetings, you have a desired outcome statement." Now that was after a few years of people learning meeting skills. Uh, we've been a few years of working from home, and it's time, you know, to get serious about uh, about what the norms about norms for being present with people. Uh, the, the 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 case is clear. The, the research is in. Mm -hmm. I this is clearly a hot topic. Someone said we can start planning our next webinar around it. <laughs> I think this, this will be a conversation that we continue continue with for some time. But I'd like to move on to our next question because I think this is also really important. Going back to challenges with leadership. My manager believes that everyone should stay in their swim lane and actively discourages collaboration. I would like some advice on how to navigate this situation. Wow. I collaborate cross-functionally with colleagues. He views it as insubordination. This is a bit of a pickle. Barry, would you mind kicking us off on this one? Uh, well, we have different worldviews here and uh, clearly different concerns, maybe values. So it's at that level 
that the conversation is important to have, not at the conversation of, I want to collaborate with them and you don't want me to collaborate with them. So that's, uh, was the say, and uh, having a sound agreement or negotiating a sound agreement is to get underneath uh, and to find out what the concern is and to be able to address that concern. That's what it comes right down to. And, you know, there, uh, if my manager continued, well, I haven't had a manager for a little bit of a while, but on teams in the, in interaction associates where I'm an SME, um, if someone had that attitude, a senior person had that attitude and I couldn't work my way around it, that's a, that's a time to say, what am I going to do as a change agent in the organization? How do I help my leader get some support? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that connects to, I'd like this, what Chris brought in going back yeah. to what, what are the, what's underlying this and why does this leader dislike or discourage? Yeah. yeah. What was, what, what happened? To what happened? Yeah. <laughs> Who hurt you, as they sometimes say? Susan, Davida, would you like to add anything on this? I'll, I'll just say that um, that's why I responded to Chris. That's a great question. Sometimes um, <clears throat> people have had bad experiences that lead them to the choices that they make. And um, I wonder if this person would be willing to, or any of us would be willing to go to the leader one-on-one, -on -one, confidentially and privately, and and say, you know, so much of the world is going collaborative, but you discourage it. Are you, you know, willing to talk about it and tell, you know, talk about what didn't, you know, just talk about it. Don't make assumptions. Are you willing to share more about your thoughts about that? But, you know, I think it's important. I would not, I would not let it go. I would ask the question and just engage my boss in a conversation to learn more about that person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I would just say Susan said before that collaboration isn't for the faint hearted or whatever. The more collaboration that we do, the the more we have to increase our skill. Davida is saying improve our or enhance our collaborative intelligence. And the 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 great thing is, is that we can learn. We can develop those muscle groups one little muscle at a time, uh, just like when we were at the gym. So. Uh, being able to ask people, well, what are you concerned about? I just want to have a better understanding of that. And know that you're not aiming for an agreement. You're just aiming for understanding. So that's having a little bit more intelligence about guiding a conversation, that this particular conversation is just about understanding and appreciation. It's not about decision making. Yeah, and I think that point is that you made is really good that if we build our skill we can maybe overcome some of what julie's talking about the fear and insecurity that maybe goes along with collaboration so thank you everyone let's see what else we have here susan i'd love for you to speak to this one how can we amplify the best ideas without shutting down other voices and encourage people to speak up Okay, well, we've said a lot about, you know, creating safe environments for people to take risks and speak up, but we know some people are more uh, reluctant or some people are more naturally introverted. And um, what I would say, I have two things I want to say about it. First of all, without knowing exactly the context, behind the question, the first thing I would say is some of it's a process issue. And what I mean by process is that the environment, the context, the container within which the conversation is happening has not been set up for people to fully participate. So I, I was just working with a, a, a a pharmaceutical company, they they had virtual meetings with 180 people in them. I mean, that's an extreme and it's ridiculous. And the company was like, oh, this is ridiculous. Let's break it down. 
to smaller groups. And so what I would say is, first of all, you're, you have to create the context. So you have to know what the desired outcomes are. People have to know what the desired outcomes are for the meeting so that they can orient themselves and preferable ahead of, preferably ahead of time, so they can orient themselves to, to get their points of view across. Not everybody talks um, as they think. It's very an extroverted tendency to talk and to figure out what you think by talking. Not everybody does that. Some people need time. So that's one thing you can do is set the meeting up for clear desired outcomes and a process that enables is sort of like a fair, um, a fair platform for all. So there are some people who are gonna jump right in, but there are other people who won't. And so I'll say that. And then the other thing that I would say is in that there is the opportunity to say, okay, let's, I know we've heard from a lot of people, is there anyone who hasn't spoken or is there anyone who has a dissenting point of view? You know, open it up, take, you know, take a put a stake in the ground and make space for people who want to disagree. And if you're virtual, they, they can disagree in chat if they don't want to say it out loud. So I would say that that's that's one way to make sure that people are are encouraged to speak up and then are validated when they do. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of the being considerate part of the pact. Yeah. The different ways people might feel comfortable. Thank you, Susan. Barry or Davida, would you like to add anything to this before we move to our last question and wrap? All right, no. we have one more question. We've gotten through almost all of them just before we close. Last one here, what advice would you give for collaborating across generations? Davida, would you take this one to start? Yes, um, thank you. I think the most important, I guess I'm a broken record. Let's not make assumptions and let's not do things that reinforce stereotypes. Um, I think those are the two most important things is to put, I would actually put the discussion on the table if the group is uh, multi-generational, talk about it and talk about um, stereotypes and other things related to their different generations and do some um, of assumption busting in those meetings. I think that would be very helpful, short little uh, activity that uh, any team can do. Mm -hmm. Curiosity is the way. Yes. Like. Wonderful. Well, with that, we'll gather up all of these insights. I want to thank all of our incredible panelists for sharing your thoughts, your ideas, and consideration today. And really want to thank the participants. Your comments and questions have made this session richer. If you are curious to continue learning with Interaction Associates, we've got some other upcoming opportunities before the year ends in the form of two live online workshops, one on facilitative leadership and the other on essential facilitation. So building those processes that will support collaboration. And then coming up in Q4, we'll be announcing our free final webinar of the year, and we'll also publish our 2024 public workshop calendar and share some exciting news on what's to come next year, including more about our Better Together Collaborative Intelligence at Work program. We've got a closing poll. We'd be very grateful for you to share your feedback with us. And in the last moment or two, since we do have you on the line, Barry, would love if you could give us a little bit of a sneak peek about the Better Together Collaborative Intelligence at Work program for people who are dying to know more right now. Well, it, thank you very much. What we talk about social intelligence and emotional intelligence and collective intelligence and all these things are, are great, of course, they're fantastic. And what we all want to focus in is how do we work better together? How do we use all these skills and insights to work better together? And we put that those things along with our own skill set around collaboration into a program called Better Together 
collabor collaborative intelligence at work. And uh, so that's uh, launching at the end of this year. So uh, please take a look out for it. And it's a it's an enterprise program. Anybody will get value out of taking it. It's an exciting development to keep updated about that and everything else we're up to. You can just click on this QR code. We share tips and tidbits about collaboration all along the way. So we'd love if you follow us on LinkedIn. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I hope you have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world, and we'll see you all soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank Rachel. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.